Brooklyn, New York. For decades, home to a religious movement numbering millions worldwide. A place I long dreamed of visiting as someone born and raised in the Jehovah's Witness faith. My chance finally came in 2002 and 2003 when, in two successive years, I was able to visit Watchtower's headquarters complex. As someone who sincerely believed the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses to be custodians of God's only approved means of worship, my visits were of profound spiritual importance. It felt as though I was seeing first-hand Jehovah's organization in action. Fast forward eight years to 2011 and everything had changed. I had woken up to the realization that the Jehovah's Witness faith was no more true than any other, and the governing body had decided to move its headquarters from Brooklyn to Warwick in upstate New York, as this recent Watchtower video explains. We'd like to let you know that the governing body has decided that if the approvals are received for the Warwick project, we will be moving completely out of Brooklyn. The world headquarters will be relocated at Warwick. Jehovah is telling us through the governing body, it's time to move out of Brooklyn. The uh, governing body, these brothers, as soon as they see Jehovah's direction, they just move. It doesn't matter if it's long held, cherished ideas, this is the way it has to be done. As soon as they see Jehovah's direction, it's done. Jehovah's direction may have been in clear evidence from the beginning, according to this video, but according to one Watchtower article, at Watchtower's 2011 annual meeting, governing body member Guy Pearce had been less than emphatic about God steering the project. Although we are not yet certain of Jehovah's will regarding Warwick, said Brother Pierce, we are proceeding to develop the site with the intention of relocating the world headquarters of Jehovah's Witnesses there. By 2013, uncertainty had vanished and a video was released reassuring witnesses that Jehovah was now 100% behind the move. Yes, well we see Jehovah's direction and the procedure from the beginning to where we are now, the way it's come together, the location of the property, the acquisition of Tuxedo. The governing body is convinced that Jehovah is directing that the world headquarters be moved to Warwick. We're absolutely convinced of that. No doubt strengthening the governing body's newfound conviction was the enormous financial incentive behind moving their headquarters. From when Watchtower first moved to Brooklyn from Pennsylvania in 1909, it amassed a considerable portfolio of properties, all used and maintained tax-free due to the organization's religious standing. To this day, Watchtower hasn't released any official figures, but the organization is reported to have pocketed well over a billion dollars from selling off its properties, with investors like Donald Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, snapping up prime real estate that was once the epicenter of my spiritual universe. Cap. The maintenance that, that the organization has done over the years was really incredible, so we're buying some really first-rate buildings. The, the people I've dealt with have all been, I'd say number, for, first and foremost, of high integrity. Uh, you know, a handshake means something with the witnesses. It's much easier to transact with a group where there's a high level of trust. But rather than provide details of the huge cash windfall, much needed at a time when membership numbers are beginning to stagnate, the leaders of an organization now numbering 8 million want their followers to focus on how exciting the move is and how much Jehovah's Witnesses should look forward to visiting the completed Warwick complex. That's what we love, the fact that everyone is putting 100% into this to accomplish this purpose of Jehovah to move the world headquarters. And we're so excited to be a part of it and to see that the brothers are, are with us in this move. Well, once this is finally finished, uh, we're excited to welcome the brothers from around the world to come visit because we have some very nice surprises for you. Not just a beautiful surrounding, but some real spiritual treasures that you're going to enjoy when you get there.
And so, in June 2017, I decided to find out what spiritual treasures Anthony Morris and his fellow governing body members had prepared at the now-completed Warwick Complex. Joining me on my visit, my wife Diana, my daughter Jessica, and former member of the Bible student movement, who were forerunners of Jehovah's Witnesses, Peter Yike. As we neared the facility, our thoughts turned to how emotional this trip would be, given that all of us had had our lives impacted in some way by Watchtower's leaders. We're very close, actually. We're, it's, it's only uh, about a 10 minute drive from here. And this is strange for me because this... We want to stay in this lane. lane. We are going... We're within touching distance of a place that has basically defined my life, defined Diana's life, and as Jessica speaks up, is even impacting on her life already, and, and Jessica's not even a JW. So oh, yeah. it's very, very, it's kind of emotional, isn't it, Diana? So. Yeah, it is. I was thinking about getting ready. Yeah. And, and in a strange way, it's an organization that impacted my life mm. because it drew my ancestral family into a Bible student movement. Is Warwick in Sterling Forest? Is that correct? Warwick is uh, surrounded by Sterling yeah. Forest. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we are close because I'm seeing all sorts of signs for Sterling. Yeah, Forest. this is uh, this is the area. We're actually in. Um, Tuxedo, New York, right now. Right, so we're really Salzburg, close. Salzburg, Tuxedo. It's, it's giving me six minutes away. <laughs> yeah, it's very close. So, yeah. uh, On arrival at the front gates, we pulled up at the security checkpoint and talked through a microphone to a man named Gus. We told Gus that we were hoping for an unscheduled tour of the facility because I was visiting from England with my family and my friend Peter, a former Bible student, was anxious to show us some of the historical exhibits about his family's religion. I mentioned that I'm not a Jehovah's Witness, but I have family members that are. All of which is true, it's just that I left out the parts about my disassociating as a witness and being shunned by my believing family members for so doing. Gus asked for my name, which I gave, he then said he thought he could work with us and asked me to pull over while he cleared things with his superiors. After a short but nerve-wracking wait with the headquarters in touching distance, Gus came to the car and asked us to drive in and follow the directions to the parking lot. Once we were parked in an underground car park, we approached the main entrance on foot, anxiously wondering whether our luck would soon run out. Thankfully, once inside, we were helped enormously by Peter. It turned out he was the king of small talk, and his anecdotes about hiking in Stirling Forest helped maintain our cover and keep our hosts' minds at ease. My wife and I do a lot of hiking up in, in Stirling Forest. Yeah. yeah. A lot of rattlesnakes back here, too. Yeah, I, I'm, seeing, yeah, I'm more afraid of ticks than snakes and bears. Yeah, well, yeah, you have to be careful with the ticks. You have to dress properly. You have to I had the saw to pull on my jeans, my uh, light coat so I was going to I use the, uh, I use the uh, off spray. Yeah. Because uh, it does work uh, with the... Uh, Having successfully infiltrated, we slipped into tourist mode and set about sampling the spiritual treasures we had been promised. As we would soon discover, our experience of Warwick would be limited to just one of the eight buildings in the complex, the Office Services Building. This central structure, parts of which felt more like a museum or art gallery than the headquarters of a worldwide religion, had been opened only months before our visit by members of the governing body. Sadly, none of these men, whose teachings and directions are interpreted by 8 million Jehovah's Witnesses as guidance from Jehovah, were on hand to greet us. Instead, three exhibits had been prepared on the upper and lower levels of the three-story structure, as this video, which would be shown months after our visit at the organization's annual meeting, would explain. The Office Services Building primarily serves as the hub for most World Headquarters functions. 
The building also includes three exhibits where visitors can take self-guided tours. The Bible and the Divine Name, which features rare Bibles and highlights how God's name has been preserved in the Scriptures. The exhibit, A People for Jehovah's Name, A Visual History of Jehovah's Witnesses, and World Headquarters Faith in Action, which explains how witnesses are organized to study, teach, and live by what we learn in the Bible. The same video featured a number of properties aside from Warwick that had recently been bought or refurbished by Watchtower as part of the move out of Brooklyn, and helpers to the governing body were seen expressing optimism for the positive impact these would have on the spirituality of visitors. I feel it's going to build up the spirituality of our brothers and sisters as they come, and as we know they're coming from all over the world and that's only going to further advance the work. To help us with building up our spirituality, each of us had been issued with headphones, which were connected to an audio device for listening to a pre-recorded narration of the tour. We also had leaflets and passes directing us to the three exhibits. The staff manning the front desk seemed anxious for us to begin our tour on the lower level at the Bible and the Divine Name exhibit, so we got in the elevator and made our way down. The exhibit was clearly popular as evidenced by the long line, and it wasn't long before Jessica started getting restless. By this point, I was beginning to notice that the overwhelming majority of staff, or Bethelites, tasked with directing people and tending to the cleaning seemed to be women. One such lady, wearing an orange lanyard to differentiate her from the visitors wearing yellow lanyards, approached to make conversation. Where are you visiting from? Um, our friend is from around here and uh, my husband is from What was your favorite song? Very nice. <laughs> My, my wife and I live in Hewitt, oh. so we're just over the, about 10 minutes away. Very nice. Oh, you have the Yeah. So you're going into Divine Name? Yeah. So just a few reminders, when you go in, uh, no flash photography, okay. and then no food items or drinking. Okay. And you can start the audio on 106. Wonderful. That's it. Thank you. I was struck by how friendly and accommodating the headquarters staff had been thus far, even though Peter and I both fell woefully short of the dress code expected of visitors to Watchtower Branch and Headquarters or Bethel facilities. Watchtower is so fastidious about its Bethel dress code that in 2008 it issued an illustrated leaflet, updated in 2016, telling witnesses what styles of dress and grooming are frowned on. Jeans and casual attire, such as Peter and I were wearing, almost certainly didn't meet the required standards, but nobody seemed to be overly concerned by our less than immaculate appearance, so we pressed on with the tour. The line for our exhibit took us through an illuminated Jehovah tunnel showing the name Jehovah in different languages, and then passed a facsimile copy of one of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Curiously, the same scroll would later briefly feature in the special annual meeting video where a volunteer can be seen adding paint to the artifact while the exhibit was being put together. The aim of the Divine Name exhibit seems to be to enhance appreciation among witnesses for the way Watchtower has inserted the name Jehovah in its unique version of the Bible, the New World Translation. To drive home the importance of using the Divine Name, a succession of antique Bibles are presented, each open to reveal how the four-letter Hebrew name of God, or Tetragrammaton, has been rendered by Bible translators down through the centuries. What witnesses aren't told is that Jehovah is, as Bible scholar Bart Ehrman puts it, a made-up English word, 
a mishmash of Hebrew, Latin and medieval European devised centuries after the Bible was written. Watchtower's own 1971 Bible Encyclopedia, Aid to Bible Understanding, admits on pages 884 and 885 that the first recorded use of Jehovah was in the 13th century by a Spanish Dominican monk named Raymundus Martini. But because witnesses have decades of their history invested in proclaiming that God's name is Jehovah, they avoid almost entirely using instead the name Yahweh, which is universally acknowledged by scholars as a far more accurate rendering of the Hebrew. Since Peter, Diana and I knew all this, we had substantially less interest in the Divine Name Tour than the witnesses we were queuing with. So we skipped ahead in the line and made our way up to the top floor of the building where an exhibit of Watchtower's history beckoned. This was what the three of us were most interested in seeing. We got some of the early guys there. George Storrs. Yeah, there's some uh, Some of the uh, early Adventists. Almost immediately greeting visitors to the exhibit titled A People for Jehovah's Name were large floor-to-ceiling sepia photographs of Charles Taze Russell surrounded by his followers. You would have been forgiven for assuming Russell was unmarried given that photos of his wife Maria were difficult to spot if they were there at all. And it didn't take long for Peter and I to notice the omission. She is not in this picture. Not the yeah. Now this is before. Um, I, I don't see her in there. No. It's, it, um, point, big omission. It's His wife helped edit the first four volumes. Well, there's some suggestion she was involved in writing the... Yeah, sorry, yeah. I, I, I heard that, that she was involved in actual writing as well. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the four volumes that we're referring to are those of Studies in the Scriptures, which Maria Russell, who for a time was the Watchtower Society's Secretary Treasurer, claimed to have shared in writing. This is a claim not to be taken lightly, since Maria was well educated, having, unlike her husband, at least finished high school. She even received training as a teacher. But when, in 1895, Russell informed Maria that he would be separating from her, the couple's relationship rapidly deteriorated, to the point where Maria sued her husband for divorce from bed and board in 1906, citing mental cruelty. During the case, Maria testified under oath that her husband had been romantically involved with a young woman named Rose Ball, who had been staying with the couple at their home. Though this testimony was essentially Maria's word against her husband's, what can't be disputed is that Russell later lied about the particulars of the scandal in his attempts to exonerate himself falsely stating that Rose was a legal minor at the time of the alleged affair, as though this somehow made the whole thing less incriminating. It's also a matter of record that Russell separated from his wife before these claims came to light, even though witnesses today are expected to honour the marriage arrangement no matter what. If a witness elder today were to separate from his wife without good cause, this could give rise to him being stripped of his position in the congregation. But apparently it's one rule for modern witness elders, another rule entirely for the religion's founder. But all that aside, Peter and I were enthralled by the images and information on display. And when we turned a corner into a dimly lit room brimming with artifacts from the organization's earliest beginnings, we could barely contain our excitement. Of particular interest to Peter was an old blue cloth depicting the divine plan of the ages, Charles Taze Russell's signature teaching that connected Bible history with the modern end times. The thing is, these are the originals. That's amazing. I think they have this. These became more complex over time. 
with uh, the crossovers yeah. that, that showed all the way down. Yeah. And they, would, they had the pyramid and uh, the pyramid with the top. And it was falling, and then they trend. They had the uh, all the lines that went across to the tabernacle. Yeah. So this was this is a very early Allegheny. Yeah. Allegheny. That is very old. I was just looking through those faces to see if there was anybody I knew, but it's really hard. This one I I do know, but I can't remember who he is. Peter and I are geeking out a little bit now for different reasons. We are here in the Watchtower headquarters at the historical exhibit and they've got here the Divine Plan of the Ages. Peter, who you'll remember from... Say hello, Peter. <laughs> Peter, who you'll remember from our Faith versus Faith video is uh, geeking out a little bit at some of the Bible students' memorabilia. They've got some really old stuff, haven't they? <laughs> Very old. So, uh, but you can see for yourself, it's quite a... Yeah. This is the Millennial Dawn series right here. Yeah, got one of the original. But hope, hopefully you can see that um, people are gen generally are just absorbed in the audio tour. That's what people are kind of really listening to. So... And the rule is that we're not allowed to do flash photography. As long as we don't do flash photography, we're okay. I haven't seen that. I've, I've obviously got that, the... Yeah, the one with the, the, the wing disc. No, that's the, um, the silver lamp version. Yeah, because if that's you look a, on the spine, there's right, a little silver lamp. Right, that's not the silver but lamp. But I've got um, studies in the scriptures. But I don't remember seeing the outlines, Perusia, Shadows, Spiritism, Hell, Evolution on the front. Yeah, the the version that we used for uh, hymns had the lyre in the front. Right. So anyway, Peter and I are, I think the the phrase is geeking out. <laughs> We're having what might be described as a nerdgasm. I can't believe I said that word in Bethel. Only a few years ago, I would have been mortified to speak so frivolously in a place that was supposed to be the hub of God's one true religion. But here I was enjoying myself, thanks in part to the relaxed, friendly vibe of the building and the fact that the other visitors seemed to be engrossed in the official audio narration. Meanwhile, Peter seemed absorbed in pursuit of images of A.H. Macmillan Russell's loyal lieutenant, who ended up being instrumental in paving the way for Joseph Rutherford to take control of the organization following Russell's death. There he is. That's A.H. McMillan right there. Let's have a look. Yeah. yeah. That's right. He was a coal porter for a while. He went up to Nova Scotia. He became basically Russell's right-hand man eventually, didn't he? Yes, he did. At a relatively young age. Like giddy schoolchildren, Peter and I continue to peruse the beautifully presented pictures and artifacts from over a hundred years ago, revealing the earliest beginnings of the Bible student movement, a movement that eventually spawned Jehovah's Witnesses. Dominating this small room was something Peter had been most anxious to see, an exhibit of the photodrama of creation. It means is public instruction along religio-scientific lines and in defense of the Bible as the inspired word of God. This eight-hour epic was, as it turns out, the first major screenplay to incorporate moving film, color slides and synchronized sound in the form of recorded speech. Most witnesses today, despite invariably not having seen it, will point to the photodrama as evidence that even in 1914, the organization was at the cutting edge of technology when it came to spreading the kingdom message. But when you examine the actual content of the film, including some of its pseudo-scientific claims, the scale of the achievement somewhat diminishes. Peter was particularly anxious to show me color slides of the photodrama containing propaganda aimed at dissuading young Bible students from pursuing higher education. 
down here is a slide that gets me very interested. Um, ah, yes, here it is. You want to talk about how far back that goes? <laughs> Astonishing artwork, isn't it? It's yeah. just unrecognizable from anything that you'd see. The artwork itself may have been unrecognizable. Satan is no longer depicted with horns and a pointy tail in modern witness literature, but the use of scare tactics to dissuade young ones from attending college and university, lest they begin developing critical thinking skills, is still a disturbing feature of Watchtower material. Material that radiates from a group of men who now use this very building as their base of operations. It is one thing to work on a job with others and quite another matter to immerse oneself in an institution of learning. Higher learning can easily influence thinking and attitudes. I have long said, the better the university, the greater the danger. The most intelligent and eloquent professors will be trying to reshape the thinking of your child. And their influence can be tremendous. Here Jehovah guarantees that one day, every person on earth will be a true worshiper of him. Will you be there? Will your son or daughter be among those alive at that time? Back to the tour, and as we continued to comb through the brightly coloured slides, we found more artwork that offered a window into the backward views that prevailed back in the early 20th century. Oh, look at that. That's fantastic. View of the races. <laughs> yes. I'm Japheth Shem Tom. Yeah, that's a family tree. <laughs> This slide perpetuated the white supremacist myth, entirely unsupported by science, that all races of the earth originated from Noah's sons Shem, Ham and Japheth, with Noah's curse upon Ham's son Canaan used as justification for the abominable treatment of black men and women for centuries. Among the most racist statements ever to be published by Watchtower alluded to this supposed curse in the following appalling quote from a 1929 Golden Age magazine. It is generally believed that the curse which Noah pronounced upon Canaan was the origin of the black race. Certain it is that when Noah said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. He pictured the future of the colored race. They have been and are a race of servants. There is no servant in the world as good as a colored servant, and the joy that he gets from rendering faithful service is one of the purest joys there is in the world. As I looked at this and other slides, it was more obvious to me than ever that there really was nothing unique or special about Watchtower's earliest teachings, and the organization's leaders were just as prone to primitive, backward ideology as others of their period. Absolutely astonishing. It's like a window into a time when people just really didn't have a clue. Whether he had a clue or not, one thing Charles Taze Russell undoubtedly had in abundance was charisma, or at least enough of it to drum up a following that would later go on to become a worldwide religion. On the wall in the main corridor that snakes around the exhibit, a reenactment of one of Russell's most famous speeches is played on a loop as part of a visual display titled A Time of Testing. The Gentile times have ended. Excuse me, Rebecca, sorry. Their kings have passed their day. <clears throat> so we know not what awaits us. As I scanned the text on the display, I couldn't help but be astonished at the way history was being rewritten. 
absent was any mention of the true expectations for 1914 as expressed in early editions of Studies in the Scriptures. As an example, take a look at what either Russell or his wife Maria wrote in The Time is at Hand, the second volume of Studies in the Scriptures. The Battle of the Great Day of God the Almighty, which will end in AD 1914, with the complete overthrow of Earth's present rulership is already commenced. Russell had been even more emphatic in the July 15, 1894 Watchtower. But bear in mind that the end of 1914 is not the date for the beginning, but for the end of the time of trouble. But rather than admit that Russell had predicted Armageddon to come by 1914 at the latest, with him and his colleagues raptured to heaven by that year, the wall display glossed over these predictions, simply saying, For more than a quarter of a century, the Bible students had been expecting that the Gentile times would end in 1914. The outbreak of World War I confirmed their belief, and many people took note. But what would come next for the Bible students? They could not imagine the tests that lay just ahead of them. Yes, because something significant happened in 1914, albeit not exactly the thing Russell had been saying would happen, Watchtower's leaders could claim that their founders' predictions were at least partly accurate. And following Russell's death in 1916, it was the turn of his successor, Joseph Rutherford, to assume the role of interpreting Bible prophecy for the movement's thousands of followers. But in describing Rutherford's rise to power, here again the wall display was lacking in honesty about what really happened. So what's interesting here is you've got before above me a time of testing and this is all about the takeover really of, of Watchtower by Rutherford. But it's interesting how the the blurbs on the wall displays completely change the nature of what happened. The death of C.T. Russell in October 1916 left the Bible students in shock. So did the ensuing struggles among some prominent men over leadership in the organisation. So it's all basically the fault of a few prominent men and not the one prominent man who did end up succeeding. When you do any amount of digging on this period of Watchtower history, you soon discover that rather than the few prominent men being the aggressors, and Rutherford the victim of their fiendish plot, in fact it was the other way round. When four of the seven Watchtower directors, a majority, discovered that Rutherford was wielding his power arbitrarily and in a way that was out of harmony with the will of his predecessor, they sought to limit his powers so that the organisation could follow the more democratic model Russell had envisioned. Ironically, they sought to bring the organisation closer to the governing body arrangement that exists today, with power resting on a number of individuals rather than just one man. But when Rutherford discovered their plans to rein him in, he cleverly outmanoeuvred them by getting them thrown off the board, leaving him free to reinvent Watchtower in his own image in the years to follow. By this point, I was still pinching myself that we had made it this far on the tour without encountering any trouble, and I was anxious to hear what Deanna made of it all. But our conversation would be cut short by Peter, who was revelling in reacquainting himself with famous Bible student names from yesteryear. Thoughts. I think you're interrupting my guided tour. Diana's actually listening to the guided tour. I can't even be bothered listening to it. There, I said it out loud, sort of. That's how you learn things. It is. Yeah. I think I found someone I know. Oh, go on. See these two brothers? Yeah. 
They're twins? Yeah. I think those are the Mitchell brothers. I knew both of them. I'm going to be completely honest. I have no idea who the Mitchell brothers okay. are. Okay, they worked, they were doormen. They were identical twins. And they worked at the door at the New York Temple. Yeah. It was sort of a joke to have the same looking person. How do you know all these people? From the New York Bible Student Ecclesia. Ah. Because they became, they, they stayed with the New York Bible students. They were young then, mm. and that's about how old they would have been. Right. And that's what they looked like. I P can. I Peter can. is, uh, as I said before, flipping out because he's. That's them. He knows a lot about the That's, Bible students. That is them. <laughs> I'm kidding. But what, I was just saying. I know them. I was just saying before how how these pictures of large gatherings of Bible students, yeah. which you can probably see behind me, are very familiar with the picture that Peter showed of the General Assembly if the, in the Faith versus Faith episode of modern day Bible students and their gatherings. And it's interesting how they were doing the same thing back then. As we moved back out into the main corridor, another display about early Watchtower history caught our attention. Now this is when things began to surge. Right at that point. The golden age, yeah, because famously um, in Russell's will. He said that you can't print anything else. Would I be right there? That's correct. You can't yes. print. You can only print the Watchtower. The print. What's printed in the Watchtower has to be decided upon by an editorial committee, not one single person. And no more magazines, no more periodicals, no more books. And of course, Rutherford came along and basically more or less ripped up that will. Uh, well, I think he found a way around it legally. Legally, right. By Our setting president. up a separate corporation uh, with uh, Clayton Whitworth and uh, George uh, Fisher as the heads of the, um, the head of that corporation and the editor of the Golden Age. So he was printing it outside of the Watchtower. And so therefore, technically, he wasn't, he wasn't breaking the will. <coughs> Well, he wasn't technically breaking the law, but he was ethically <laughs> going against. Now there's a difference. <laughs> <laughs> Between filling in the blanks on Watchtower's whitewashing of history with Peter, I was pining for the old books that were still missing from my collection back home. Got that. Not 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 got that, and not got that. Look how large these conventions are. Yeah. Is that the um, one that you were talking about? Yeah. You said it was... Uh, I, we were talking about Cedar Point, but yeah. this is Columbus. This is the Columbus right. Convention. The, the J.W. 1931. And they didn't, they didn't spell it out, and so yeah. they left that a mystery yeah. to be revealed. The 1931 Columbus, Ohio Convention was a pivotal point in the history of Jehovah's Witnesses. It was the event at which they completed their separation from the Bible students when Rutherford announced the religion's new name, which was teased with the initials JW on the convention program. Last, I, th I think this was the last Christmas celebration. Yeah, this is the last. I think the guy in the foreground, I think it was that guy. Yeah. I think he was responsible for coming up with the ban on Christmas. Oh, was he? Yeah. Oh, interesting. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and at the table, is that, is that Rutherford? Rutherford? There's the man himself. Yeah, that's Joseph Rutherford, Rutherford. The head of the table. Yeah. And this is 26, so... Um, the two people I would know at least, Pollock and Woodworth, would be in here. But no, this is 1926 and yes. celebrating Christmas. They didn't leave until 28. Yeah. Christmas was one of a number of things to be dispensed with under Rutherford's presidency, along with saluting the flag, growing a beard, and celebrating Mother's Day. Rutherford wanted his so called theocracy to be as different as possible from religions of the day by making sure almost anything he didn't approve of was denounced in the strongest terms. 
Incredibly, for a short period in the early 1940s, even singing of hymns was verboten for witnesses. Not that you would know this from reading the Warwick wall displays. Peter, this is interesting. Um, those of you who uh, have my book will know that I write a little bit about Rutherford not liking music. Yes. And there's a paragraph here, music, singing praises to Jehovah has always been important in true worship and to the Bible students. And it's interesting because Rutherford actually banned singing at the meetings yes. for the, the final few years of his life and only after he died did they bring, they it, bring back. it back. Yes. Amazing. As the tour progressed, almost inevitably we started to see material about the persecution of Jehovah's Witnesses down through the decades. If there is one thing that reinforces the beliefs of Witnesses, convincing them that they are suffering as Jesus did, it is random acts of savagery and intolerance from Satan's worldly system of things. But notice you've got here the, the presentation, If They Persecuted Me. Hasn't that been a central theme of JW theology from the very beginning about the persecution element yeah. and how we, we, we must be God's true people Yes, because we're being persecuted. Right, right. So this is basically a room dedicated to the persecution of Jehovah's Witnesses. And you have the various uniforms from concentration camps and prisons. When you are a Jehovah's Witness, you rarely stop to ponder that your religion doesn't hold any kind of monopoly when it comes to the persecution of religious minorities by ruthless or despotic regimes, such as the massacre and enslavement of Yazidis by ISIS, or the abominable mistreatment of Muslims in Rohingya, to cite just two recent examples. Nor do you notice when governments and the world's media join in condemning the mistreatment of witnesses, as has recently been the case with the ban on witnesses in Russia. No, if Jesus said they will persecute you also, and if there are clear examples of persecution in witness history, this must mean that you have happily stumbled on God's one true faith. With our tour of witness history nearing its end, I was finally able to catch up with Diana and get her thoughts on our visit. So, you were saying before that you're listening, <laughs> uh, have you heard anything interesting so far? I don't know, it just um, strikes me out that they're posting with some things that happened in the past that they would not do now. Right. Um, for example, um, Debating Rutherford. Of course, yeah. You know, they both do. Um, he uh, often debated with him and we prevail. Today, there's they no really way the governing him. body would debate with anyone, is there? Yeah, so I, I just find it odd that they're both seen about something. That's actually, that's actually one of the few things I can. I can uh, admire about Rutherford because as awful as the man was he at least wasn't afraid speaking to journalists and that was one thing that they they were, that you could say that was good about them was that they they were willing to stand up for what they were writing about whereas the current leadership not willing to take the heat for the uh, the blowback as it were but thoughts on uh, how easy it's been to get inside <laughs> Yeah. Well, I say easy, it wasn't that easy, was it? Yeah. We had a certain degree of um, diplomacy was required, yeah. would you I, say? Yeah, uh, although I'm very strict on not wanting to lie. Yeah. Um, we I didn't, see. we didn't though. Yeah. We, we just were very economical yeah. with... Uh, How with, we displaced our truths. With our truths, yeah. Yeah, but uh, it, it's a weird yeah. feeling. I'm just keeping these on so I don't it's, need to yeah. engage in any conversation. But it's strange. We were saying this before, we, we crossed the Brooklyn Bridge yesterday and it was eerie to be so close to a place where... a, a place where men reside or have worked who have shaped our lives mm. and continue to shape our lives and even shape Jessica's life, our little three-year-old girl. From those from those buildings, and now they've obviously moved here. But it's eerie to be in a place 
that is responsible for so much of what we're going through and so much of what lots of people are going through. With much on which to reflect, we stumbled into another side room where a microphone had been set up as part of a display about Watchtower's early attempts at broadcasting over the radio. I couldn't resist joining in the fun with a brief plug for a certain YouTube channel. Hello, my name is Lloyd Evans and you are watching the John Cedars channel, live from World Headquarters, New York. Joking aside, the broadcasting of Watchtower's teachings has certainly come a long way since Rutherford was forced off the radio in the 1930s. On a wall in the main corridor, one of the displays heralded a recent change of strategy for the organisation in its attempts to spread the word. Watchtower's video website, JW Broadcasting. My good friend, Stephen Lett, something tells me I won't get to meet him on this occasion. Maybe next time. With the history tour over, I retreated to a quiet seating area between the exhibits and reflected on the progress of the trip so far. We're kind of halfway now through the tour. Not quite sure what we're gonna see next. There's a few different options. We've just done the history part of the tour, but there's actually four or five different tours that you can go on. Uh, one of which is a tour of the um, premises outside, the, gr the, the grounds surrounding the um, the battle and you can see there there's the lake that uh, comes right up to the headquarters buildings I'm just sat now in a little uh, waiting area where you can just kind of uh, relax a little bit you can see some rather vibrant uh, imagery behind me and uh, I, overall I'm very impressed with uh, the how can I put it, the way they've done this building. It's, it's, they've clearly uh, spared no expense in putting it together, shall we say. And uh, equally impressed really with how we've been received. Um, I'm here with scraggly hair and a beard and people just could not be nicer. <laughs> I think uh, probably they're, they're trying to, they, they know immediately that I'm not a Jehovah's Witness, they obviously don't know the full story, but it's it's refreshing to see smiles, um, even if the smiles are probably for different reasons than I would like, it's still nice to have the nice friendly reception. Although I'd been hoping to get outside for a tour of the grounds, the only thing you can do as a regular visitor to Warwick that doesn't involve walking around exhibits, it turned out these tours had been called off due to the weather. So all that remained was to take a quick look around the Faith in Action exhibit, which featured a number of baffling interactive displays designed to enhance appreciation for Jehovah's organization. So this part of the tour is kind of an interactive uh, exhibit, I guess you could call it, uh, talking about Watchtower's growth, uh, proclaiming how fantastic uh, its various aspects of spiritual food have proved to be. You can see on this wall, take in spiritual food. And there's basically light installations on the walls that give you various statistics about how well the organization is doing. Behind me are some light boxes about meeting together. There is, oh, Gone. Hang on. Oh, I can, I can change it. <laughs> so there's our man David Splain, king of explaining the overlapping generation teaching. Some quite sophisticated bits of um, tech for viewing some of the exhibits. And you, you probably see on the walls, it, it has projectors, I assume, in the ceilings. Yeah, I think you can see projectors, bits of kit that are projecting images onto the walls. So, constantly changing. Here's a section on shepherding. And, uh, and emergencies. So shepherding, local. Um, we would like to hear from you. 
Have you ever attended the School for Congregation Elders? I guess I have, the Kingdom Ministry School. Yes. Submit. That's all it asks. It's a very short survey. So you can see here they have a box, disasters. And if I... Oh, we would like to hear from you. Have you ever assisted with disaster relief? Um, no. Submit. I don't know what I just did there. I hope I didn't skew the figures. Uh, meeting the need, let's see what that says. When the coordinators oh, committee receives crikey. a report that a disaster has taken place, whether it be a natural disaster, John Eckren is telling us a terrorist about attack or other tragedies, one of the first things we do is establish communication with the branch committee. The branch committee often appoints a disaster relief so now committee. They work closely an audio with the visual display the talking about disaster relief. Just to make As sure I mentioned in the previous really JW Broadcasting and report, then a report is made to the disaster relief and for Jehovah's Witnesses is just for now, Jehovah's Witnesses. It's never for non-believers, which I don't think is really something that you can be so proud of. We can let the whole brotherhood know how our brothers are doing. Having soon exhausted Warwick's bounty of spiritual treasures, at least those available to visitors, I left Peter and Deanna behind and decided to briefly explore the middle floor, the floor with the reception area. Over the course of our visit, it seemed the number of visitors had increased dramatically, and I was overwhelmed by how popular the headquarters seemed to be as a visitor attraction, almost a Disneyland for JWs. At times, I felt like I was right back at a JW assembly or convention. Almost everywhere you looked, witnesses were excitedly chatting among themselves and apparently reveling in being able to spend time at their spiritual mecca within touching distance of the governing body. There were no catering facilities to feed the steady stream of visitors. Instead, a dining area or multi-purpose room had been allocated, complete with water cooler, for witnesses to sit down and eat packed lunches they had brought with them. And for witnesses who felt compelled to show their appreciation for the tour, credit card machines were positioned fairly prominently near the exits, complete with instructions so that witnesses could burn some plastic before getting back on the coach. Of course, absent from these instructions was any mention that donated funds might be used to help pay for court fees and damages incurred as a result of Watchtower's widespread mishandling of child sex abuse, a cover-up on an unimaginable scale that Watchtower refuses to publicly acknowledge or apologise for. piece of wall art showing a map of the world featured prominently, with the scripture from Matthew 24 verse 14 emblazoned along the bottom. And this good news of the kingdom will be preached in all the inhabited earth for a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. The message was clear. The worldwide preaching work of witnesses is to be interpreted as further evidence that Bible prophecy is being fulfilled and Armageddon is imminent. This day of wrath, heralded for decades by successive Watchtower leaders, would see the annihilation of everyone, including myself, Diana, Peter and Jessica, who don't want to be Jehovah's Witnesses. Once the dust settles on the carnage and devastation, the earth would be repopulated by witnesses like these, devout worshippers who take their belief seriously enough to make the pilgrimage to the epicentre of their faith, as well as the various Bethelites directing people around the exhibits, collecting used audio devices and standing outside with umbrellas. Suitably reassured of just how much I didn't belong here, it was becoming apparent that my time at Warwick was nearing an end. Before heading back to the others, I decided to try my luck at getting my hands on a 2017 yearbook, 
a missing piece of my Watchtower literature collection, and as it turns out, the last of its kind since it would be announced a few months later that the publication of yearbooks would be discontinued. Using every ounce of what little charm I can muster, I succeeded in getting one of the Bethel ladies, who I found sitting on a chair by a door, to run and get me this elusive book, which she agreed to do only after first getting a male colleague to come and stand by the door to make sure neither myself nor anyone else tried to go through it. It was at this point that it hit me just how tightly guarded this part of the complex was and how impossible it was to see the work going on behind the scenes unless you are sufficiently well connected. It felt almost as though this visitor attraction had been designed to be hermetically sealed from the business end of the complex, with visitors only seeing precisely what the governing body wants them to see. I made my way back to Peter, Diana and Jessica, and before handing in our audio devices, we decided to film an unscheduled interview on the balcony at the rear of the building overlooking the lake. Apologies in advance for the sound quality, we were trying not to speak too loudly for obvious reasons. So we're here now at the end of the tour. Um, still pinching myself with how, it's, how well it's gone. Uh, everyone's just been very nice. Obviously people don't know anything about what I'm involved in. I'm, I'm sure if they did know what I was involved in, it would have been a different story. Um, but I think you were saying as well, weren't you, Diana, that um, they are nice people. Yeah. You know, th these are some really nice people who frankly don't deserve to be lied to. And they've shown us nothing but kindness. And yeah, warmth. you just want to give them a big hug. Yeah, you want to hug them. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a surreal experience, and I'll probably need some time to process it. It's been interesting to you as well. It's been very uh, interesting. As a former Bible student, yes. to see all the history on the yes. show. Yeah, to see that history was amazing. Um, to, to know it, but then to see the original pieces. Uh, that we were geeking out of it, weren't we, yeah, at some of the yeah, uh, we were. exhibits? Especially some of the older, uh, the older, like the, the old chart of the ages. Uh, yeah. That, that particular chart was probably one of the earlier versions because uh, it was missing the pyramid and the tabernacle. And yet it was on full display and you could actually touch it, couldn't you? Yeah, yes. Yeah, it was a, a cloth. And, uh, just uh, phenomenal <laughs> to yeah. see that, to see so much of what I recognize, you know, because Bible students are very, um, very uh, proud of their history too, uh, and they they look back like a, uh, with a longing. Yeah, there's like a, a longing for the old days. Yeah, whenever I heard the stories from the old timers, it was just like. Um, you know, this is the way it was in the, you know, the good old days. Yeah. You know? well, that's interesting because there is a little bit of that with JWs, but I think with JWs it's more a case of looking forward. They don't really cherish as much, I think, their books as in, they're not really interested in, in reading studies from the scriptures or anything like that, yeah. whereas I, I guess it's a bit different with... Uh, well, you know, and that was a, that's an interesting thing because um, we were always taught that... Um, Jehovah's Witnesses were prevented from reading their old material studies in the scriptures and that if they did they would come back to the truth and that was the way I always thought of it but now I understand that we look at it as, as archaic yeah it's not it's old life it's, old. Yeah. it's irrelevant and just you can probably hear the noise going on in the background one thing that it has really kind of impressed me. Oh, well, I say impressed. It has been impressed upon me is how popular this place is. I mean, the lobby area is heaving, isn't it? Yes. There's, there's all of these seating areas, and they're all full of people. They were saying, was it 69,000 visitors they've had so far? In the two months that they've been open. In the two months they've been open. In about 1,200 a day or so that they average. And you can really tell when you're in the lobby that it is that popular because there are people from more or less everywhere. And there's, there's these, what I find interesting as well is how many uh, sisters, because you see um, Bethelites with tags around their, their necks with I, meaning information. But I would say the 
so far, the, the, it's been predominantly women, sisters doing it. That have been doing the, the help and the assistance. And they, they'll like, come right up to you and say, is everything okay? And um, can I help you? Even yeah, car park. Our picture for us. Yes. Even car park duties. Car park duty as well, yeah. yeah. But uh, really a surreal experience. As I say, I'm going to need some time to process this but um thanks so much for oh yeah for well, being, thank you for being my wingman yeah. <laughs> on this trip well this was my first time here and so i found it interesting and i think i found uh, an old picture of two people that i knew uh, growing up but they were old oh you I showed you showed uh, we've got that on film yeah, actually I, I, and identical twins yeah and it's then, quite scary how many people who are quite clearly long, long dead you can recognise. Yes. I, know, I know those guys. Yeah. And with that, our day at Warwick was over. We handed in our audio devices and left the premises just as peacefully as we had arrived, with no animosity or unpleasantness. Just a bittersweet feeling of genuine affection mixed with pity for the witnesses we had encountered many of whom will likely spend the majority of their lives serving a group of leaders who had been only a stone's throw away during our visit, but who might as well have been on the other side of the planet given how well they had screened themselves off from those whose lives they influence. Will I ever return to this place, this gleaming lakeside retreat tucked away in Stirling Forest, that just happens to be the beating heart of a religion that continues to impact on my life long after I have left. Honestly, I don't know. If I'm welcome, then yes. But in a place such as this, welcomes can easily be overstayed. Did I find spiritual treasures here as Tony Morris had promised? Definitely not. But that's not to say treasures aren't to be found for those absolutely determined to find them. Spirituality, you see, is subjective. If you happen to crave absolute certainty, if you need to feel like you have all the answers, if you long for a feeling of community, to be involved in a movement that is bigger than you, if you don't mind being lied to so long as the lie makes you feel better, if you simply must have a utopian future to look forward to for you and your family, no matter what the cost, no matter how cruel and punishing the entry requirements are, no matter how much death and destruction this utopia requires, and if you want all these things badly enough to set aside your critical thinking skills and subjugate yourself to a group of men cloistered away in their own private universe, the religion you need to join is Jehovah's Witnesses, and the spiritual Mecca you need to visit is Warwick. <laughs>